you know, I see time management as actually mind management or like energy management. Because the thing is, we all have like the same number of hours a day, but we do see that there are different people that have managed to achieve different amounts in that time. And what made the difference for me was that it was about my energy management because what was happening was I was spending so much time internally inside my own brain, let's say like with self-critical thoughts, like beating myself up for like these seemingly little things that I felt I could have done better. Um, and, you know, yeah, procrastination, that was a really big one that was linked to perfectionism. So a lot of the time when you have this perfectionistic tendency, you then dedicate a lot of time and energy into like procrastination because you're worried about, you know, oh, I don't want to start it because it has to be perfect, that kind of thing. This episode, I meet with Dr. Trudy Lynn, being the Young Australian of the Year for South Australia in 2022. She is one of only 25 specialists in special needs dentistry in Australia. Trudy is involved in various national and international advocacy roles. She's an honorary senior clinical lecturer at the University of Adelaide and on the board of studies for special needs dentistry for the RACDS. In addition to her clinical practice, Trudy is a certified mindset and leadership coach and workshop facilitator. She's the founder and director of Extra Mile Coaching, which specializes in mindset coaching for oral health care professionals. On this episode, we discuss her father's dental issues and the challenges she faced in providing treatment, common struggles amongst graduates and healthcare clinicians, including a lack of purpose, difficulty with patient communication, and managing imposter syndrome and perfectionism. And there's this discussion about the different stages of a dental career in the search for filming. CBD Junkie Dental Podcast is about connecting with passionate Australian dentists who are improving themselves and have attended various CBD courses. My aim is to find out for you the best CBD courses around and what they did to help get them to where they are today. So you can consider doing it and becoming the best dentist you can be quicker. Hi, CPD Junkie fam. I'm your host, Dr. Lawrence Doan, and today we're joined by Dr. Trudy Lin. Dr. Trudy Lin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So first off, I want to say congratulations on winning the Young Dentist. I'm a Young Australian of the Year in 2022. How's Thank your you. life been since then? <laughs> um, I would say, like, if I was to use one word to describe it, it would be surreal. Um, there are still some days that I wake up, I think particularly after the invitation to the Queen's funeral, like that felt extremely surreal. Um, I just wake up and sometimes I'm wondering if it actually really happened or not. Um, but it did. <laughs> there was a few times early on, like after I first won the award that I would actually go to the trophy and actually just check to make sure my name was still on it. Like that kind of level of like just, you know, finding it just very unexpected. Um, but yeah, such a such an honor, and I'm just so grateful to be in the place that I am now, where I'm able to use it to effectively advocate and bring more visibility to my area of specialty, which is special needs dentistry. Right. So you're saying that they they flew you over? Is that right? Yeah, they did. Um, traveled with the prime minister over to um, London. Yeah. Wow, that's that would have been an experience all in itself, eh? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So, okay, I know your your interest is in special needs, but before you're a specialist, you're a, a dental student at one point, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what happens at this point when you graduate dental school? Uh, so, so my journey was that um, in dental school, I had done a rotation in the special needs unit. And that's what sparked my passion and had in the back of my mind like this is something that I'd like to look at specializing in down the track um, so early on I had this picture of where I wanted to go um, I ended up being in this one year formal mentoring program that was offered like through the public service did that for 12 months had a lot of CPD and education and support in that first year and then in my second year, I secured a job at the special needs unit. So I was getting really practical, hands-on um, experience with special needs uh, patients before I actually started my specialist training. Right. So you already knew you were interested in special needs um, prior to being part of it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So 
um, from a young age, I already was really set on dentistry because my dad, he has tetracycline staining. So seeing the impact of how, um, you know, he had a lot of uh, issues with sensitivity on his teeth as well. Um, and he had a lot of shame and stigma attached to the way his teeth looked. And so I just grew up seeing how much impact that had on so many aspects of his life. He wasn't able to get a job because he was rejected from job interviews. Um, it had like an impact on his self-confidence and his socialization. And so then I just always had this passion to want to become a dentist. And I've had family members who have um, fit into that special needs industry umbrella as well. So my youngest brother, Aaron, has autism. And I have various family members who have had dementia and um, a few family members who have passed away from cancer as well. And so those are all areas in which you, you look after those types of patients as a specialist in special needs dentistry and definitely that family lived experience and seeing what they went through is what cultivated that passion to them want to look after other people that experience the same thing. And doing that rotation in the special needs unit is really helped me cement it because you can have this idea in your mind, this is what I'd really like to do. But until you actually get the practical experience, you don't really know whether it's a good fit until that happens. So definitely it was after that final year rotation, I spent that whole year in the special needs unit and I was thinking, this is definitely what I want to pursue. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, right? So I mean, eventually you became a dentist and like you said, your dad had all these issues with it. Did you get the chance to, you know, um, you know, treat him and alleviate him from some of these? Um... Oh, yeah. So that's a really good question because the thing is, a lot of people ask me that. And, um, and I think when I went into dental school, that was what I had in mind was like, okay, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to now, you know, the, the goal is to like help my dad like and fix like his teeth the thing is like um and I even like in fourth year dental school I asked my prosthodontics um tutor and lecturer like oh showed him like pictures of my dad's teeth and said what do you recommend and things like that um with this goal of after I graduate I'm going to fix it for him and he has a really severe form of it so um really really dark like we're talking almost black um, that kind of staining. And also he had banding too. Um, so these lines across, which um, had different shades. So it meant that he, the veneers and more conservative options, which don't cause as many uh, kind of pulpal issues in the long term and, uh, um, you know, not like more conservative, were not available to him. Mm. And that's something that I discussed with the lecturer and everything. And so that ended up being a very disappointing outcome because since he does suffer a lot from the sensitivity with his teeth, I just knew that, okay, well, if the only option to actually mask that staining is, you know, full crowns on basically all of his teeth, then the benefits of that, um, like the benefits of the aesthetics doesn't justify the risks that he'll have with like pain with his teeth in the long term. So at that point, I was like disappointed with that outcome. Um, but, you know, and I actually told my dad and he was saying, oh, look, this is something that I've lived with my entire life. And, you know, the thing is, uh, humans are really adaptable and resilient. And the thing is, when he was blocked from being able to go and get jobs from you know another employer what he did was he became an entrepreneur um, and then he started an online business because then it meant that his smile was no longer a problem you know because he wasn't having that interaction he was working for himself so it didn't matter what his boss thought or potential boss would think about what his teeth looked so he was really thriving but in his own way he didn't let his teeth necessarily hold him back in later years of life so what happened was I ended up going um I've drawn upon my dad's experience and seen how it can um, impact people negatively. And so this is enough reason for me to now go out and help other people, but it's much bigger than just um, my dad's story now. It's actually about how can I educate others? How can I make a bigger impact? And you know, this is why I'm so uh, heavily involved in advocacy now about every person having the right to access to oral health care. And my dad happened to be that first story that then inspired me to do this work. Wow. Okay. I mean, hopefully with, you know, like further developments in, dent in dentistry, you know, hopefully one day your dad will be able to get some sort of treatment that he would, 
you know, hopefully bring some happiness to his smile as well. But I mean, it sounds like he's, you know, really um, leading a fulfilling life at the moment. So that's mm. even, that's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few other things there that we're going to unpack a little bit later, but I want to come back to yourself. I want to talk to, about, you know, when you first graduated, you said that you're attending courses, CPD courses along the way. What kind of courses were you attending and, you know, how were you kind of aligning it with where you wanted to go? Yeah. So um, in that 12 month mentorship program, they provided a lot of CPD. So I had like a real structure. Um, They had um, every month there was a different specialist topic. So they would take you through, for example, pediatrics and then um, and then fix pros and then rem pros. So it was very um, it's very good because it was systematic. And also it meant that you knew what was coming ahead and you could then fill in the gaps of knowledge or prepare ahead of time and think about um, what questions you wanted to ask and things like that. They also based it around case studies too. So that's definitely been a um, something that I've adopted through my whole clinical career is around how do we actually look at implementing the knowledge that we've learned. And I think talking through case studies and looking for CPD where They don't just present you the information, but they also talk about, okay, this is a real life patient scenario in which you can implement it in is like a real theme. So that was, so that kind of 12 months, they took me through a lot of the clinical and technical um, dentistry skill sets. So um, I ended up voluntarily in terms of this is the CPD that I chose outside of that um, mentorship program. I actually engaged in a lot of non-clinical CPD And that's something that, you know, if I were to give advice to um, new graduates around when you're looking at making sure you have all the skills that you need to be thriving in your career and like a holistic dentist is to remember to engage in that non-clinical aspect because dental school has a strong focus in technical skills. And then you'll notice a lot of CPD courses out there are all about, you know, specific dental technical skills as well. But remember that there's a whole like hidden curriculum that didn't get filled in in dental school that now you can be proactive around filling for yourself. And so a really good example of this is like patient communication, or I would say communication in general, because you can have great clinical skills, but then if you lack the communication skills to help patients trust you, understand their treatment options, want to come back and see you, then it doesn't matter how good your clinical skills are, you may not actually get a chance to use them. Um, And, you know, not just patient communication, but communication with your colleagues and your boss, like there are courses out there that you can take to specifically help you hone the skill set of having difficult conversations, negotiation, setting professional boundaries, de-escalating conflict. Um, So I engaged in a lot of those types of courses in my first few years out. And that really did, I think, I would say that had the most impact in me being able to now branch out and do other things in my career, help benefit me in my clinical career, but then also has now helped me in branching out and doing all these other non-clinical things as well. Yeah. I mean, if you don't mind name dropping, what kind of courses were these that you're attending? Yeah. So the one that comes to mind immediately is uh, I mentioned about having difficult conversations and de-escalating conflict. So there's this course that I did through the leading clinicians program and it is offered separately. It's called Crucial Conversations. Um, And there's another one which is more geared towards people in leadership positions um, called crucial accountability. And those skill sets, you know, it helps you in a professional career, but it can also help you in your professional, uh, personal life as well. So very, very useful. Okay. And then, so in that, so you're learning these skills. I assume you're kind of, are other clinicians like dentists also doing these ones or is it like, anyone who's like in a health professional or in a kind of because you mentioned leadership um uh workshop i was saying um what were the other colleagues that were other dentists or yeah that's a good question so um the leading clinicians program it was a 12-month program offered through uh, sa health um and what it was open to was any person that works under sa health Um, can apply for it who's in a formal leadership position and so it included not just dentists but GPs um, yeah uh, all sorts of allied health professionals and things like that so it's not specifically for dentists Um, 
However, all of the skills that they teach you about leadership can apply no matter what jurisdiction or um, like clinical work you're in. Um, so I did that and the, the 12 month course, the thing that I found most impactful and most helpful um, was the fact that it had one-on-one -on -one coaching and also group coaching. And um, one of the things that I think is really useful for people that are in that area where they're not sure which direction they want their career to take and they're wanting to make decisions around that, um, seeking a career coach um, is actually a really useful thing. Um, the coach that I had during the 12 month leading clinicians program, he helped me actually decide that I was going to do my specialist training the following year and also help me unpack some of the layers of self-limiting beliefs that I unconsciously had around whether I could become a specialist. I knew this is what I wanted to do, but I had all these other limiting beliefs that were stopping me from believing, oh, can I actually balance the workload? Will I find it, you know, too emotionally challenging? Because I knew that was a part of my personality that might make it like, you know, very challenging to then be able to commit to in the long term. And so, yeah, that coaching really was what helped me take the trajectory that my career did. Um, yeah, again, that's like something that's hopefully relevant to your listeners to think about coaching because I feel like in the dental profession, a lot of us get told to go get yourself a mentor, but there are different aspects of coaching which help you in a way that a mentor can't. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so obviously when, when I hear that, I think that um, a lot of times that people go into dentistry because like, okay, that's it. I go into dental school. Uh, I come out, I'm a dentist. Now what? Like, how do I figure mm. out the next stage of my life? Right. And to your point, having a, someone who can help guide you to figure out for yourself yes. um, what is the best path that you actually want is something that you know you should might or you might want to consider earlier on, especially when you haven't quite figured it out yet. Absolutely, yeah. So you touch on a really important point there, which is the big difference between mentoring and coaching. Um, see, because coaching is a skill set where that person is not there to tell you what to do, but to use all these specific techniques to then help you figure out and unlock your own potential and figure it out within yourself. And so that's why it's really useful for things like career progression, because that's not something that someone else can tell you. Um, only you can figure that out for yourself. Whereas a mentoring relationship is very much based upon the mentor having all this knowledge and experience, and then they just give you advice and give you that, you know, basically share that with you. So the analogy that I really like to use is that in a mentoring relationship, it's like the mentor is the person that has the gold. They have the knowledge and the experience and the expertise, and then they share the gold with the mentee. In a coaching relationship, the opposite is true. The coach sees the gold within the person that they're coaching, and then their job is to help that coachee tap into the gold that they have within themselves and maybe see something within them that they can't see within themselves. And so, uh, yeah, I could talk about this all day because um, I am <laughs> I am a mindset coach. And uh, one of the things, it's interesting that you asked that question around, oh, were there other dentists? Was this a dentist specific course or was this open to everyone? Because um, I ended up becoming a like leadership coach and facilitator of the leading clinicians program because it just transformed my life. So I wanted to give back to that program. And then over time, I'm still involved with it. I still run um, mindset coaching workshops for the program, but I've yeah. actually moved into um, like last year, I uh, started my own coaching practice, mindset coaching practice, specializing for oral healthcare professionals because I couldn't see anything out there um, in our industry that was actually specifically geared towards helping yeah, oral healthcare professionals and the specific challenges that we have and helping them navigate the things that you know, are demanding and tricky about our careers. Um, so yeah, it's just great to hear that you've actually you know, tapped into that understanding of how coaching offers something different from mentoring. And I feel that's a really important thing that I'd like to advocate for in our profession in the future is there's all these mentoring courses out there um, and, you know, kind of uh, programs that are offered to new graduates, but how can we integrate coaching into that? So they're synergizing and getting the benefits of both. Yeah. And if you don't mind me asking a follow-up question on that, which is, you know, what are the struggles that you're seeing that graduates um, or health clinicians are experiencing uh, most commonly? 
So the clients that come to see me, a lot of them are struggling with um, sense of purpose and engagement with their career. So, um, you know, we talked about earlier how a lot of them have been focused on improving their technical skills and they're believing that that is the most important thing that needs to be worked on. But then they're, the things that they're coming to me that they're saying they're finding challenges with is actually, you know, based upon other things. For example, handling patients that are really difficult or challenging um, to communicate with, um, setting professional boundaries, having these thought patterns because I'm a mindset coach so there is a little bit of a niche about looking at thought patterns is that they're managing imposter syndrome and perfectionism and all of this is coming from external pressures that they're feeling and feeling a little bit disempowered like these are the expectations that are set from my boss from my colleagues from lecturers that I've heard from dental school from patient expectations and then feeling a bit disempowered to then um, manage all of these different things as a new relatively new graduate Um, and so then my course is around helping and supporting people to then take control of what they have um, control over which is basically their thought patterns you know what they say what they do and then putting them in the most empowered position to then make the change that they want to make. So a lot of them, <clears throat> they've invested a lot of time, effort um, and years of their life into becoming a dentist. So they don't necessarily want the solution to be, oh, I have to leave the profession. Um, but they're also thinking that all of these external factors is what's causing their stress, their burnout um, and their disengagement. So I'm helping to take them to a place where actually you know, if you want to leave the profession, you can, but a lot of them, they don't want to. But how can you maximize your own autonomy and your own agency, focus on what you can control um, so that it means that even though your situation is a change, it is, hasn't changed, you're still a dentist, your internal experience of how you experience your life as a clinician, or if you want to branch out into other things, How does that completely change by changing your mindset? The one thing that you have full control over at all times. Mm, Interesting. So, I mean, listening to you, I'm thinking that it may not actually just be um, new graduates. It may be someone who's, you know, five, six years down the track or even, you know, 10 years down the career path. And they're kind of trying to figure out, you know, if this is where they want to continue. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting you say that because I would say, Majority of the um, people that I'm helping at the moment tend to be in that newer grad um, kind of uh, demographic. And I think it's mainly because uh, probably of my Young Australian of the Year Award and just, you know, that kind of, um, uh, I think it speaks to a lot of young young dentists out there. The fact that I'm visible and I'm a young female leader, someone making a difference. And so they're kind of like drawn to that. So I think that's the kind of... Um, clientele that I'm drawing at the moment just naturally um, through that Um, but certainly I have as um, it gets more well known that I am I have started this practice in conversation with other colleagues there is seems to be like this other kind of plateau point where specialists for example so what they've done is they've reached this plateau point where they're starting to feel disengaged in their work and then what they do is they go oh I know I'll I'll go and do a specialist training now Um, I'll become a specialist and so they kind of use that to try and like get themselves out of this plateau that they're feeling. And that works for, you know, a number of years. And then they hit their second plateau where they're kind of like, oh, wait, now that I'm a specialist, now that, you know, the hecticness of, you know, becoming a specialist has, you know, settled down, they start to feel that lack of engagement again and now are seeking again. So it's almost like there's this second um, part where they're like, all right, now what? And they're looking for what's the next thing. And for some people, it's not actually, you know, specialist training. They might actually decide, okay, I'm going to now go into practice ownership. Again, it's just like a way for them to seek something externally in their circumstances, like change that to then change the way that they're feeling internally. Whereas there is a way that you can then end up looking carefully around what's going on for yourself, like with your feelings and your thoughts and these subconscious thought patterns that you have that mean that you don't necessarily need to seek that next step in order to feel fulfilled. Maybe you could do that 
a different way. Um, so I kind of help people unpack that. And, you know, it's okay if they turn out that, you know what, yes, I do want to go and, you know, go down practice ownership or something like that. But the problem is unless you fix like the root cause, you know how like health professionals are always taught first principles, you don't want to just address the symptoms. You want to actually look at the root cause. Otherwise it won't give you a long-term outcome, right? So yeah. you can prescribe antibiotics, but unless you treat the infection inside the tooth, the problem's just going to come back. It's almost like the same thing that you see with these dentists. Like if they're not fixing their internal thought patterns and beliefs, then they can make these changes like go, okay, I'm going to go start a family now, or I'm going to go and seek specialization training to change these uncomfortable feelings of disengagement. I feel the problem is it comes back in a few years time after the novelty wears off around trying to change that external circumstance. Yeah. I mean, you, you really kind of beat me to the question, which is what I was <laughs> going to ask you, which is, you know, eventually at some point you decide, you know, about practice ownership, being a specialist, being a super GP and to, to the other question, you know, starting your family. Um, you've definitely answered it in a different way than I would have, you know, most um, people would have answered it. So um, I think it's an interesting insight into how to think about it. And so speaking for your own journey, which hmm. is, you decide to specialize. I mean, what are some of the things that you were kind of, I mean, I mean, I guess you kind of alluded to, and if someone's listening in, they're probably realizing that, you know, it's innately within, from the very beginning, you kind of, or were already you kind of pinpointing yourself towards this um, specialist route, hmm. um, going down it, but did it cross your mind? Maybe some of those other factors, because um, you probably were seeing through other colleagues that they were, thinking about something else, um, some of those other things, did that kind of, I don't know, um, affect yeah, how you thought so, about your path? Yeah, in terms of how I worked it out. And so this is where um, it goes back to how I said that coach that I had during that 12-month leadership program, because I had 12 months of coaching where it was there, he was there holding space, getting me to really reflect upon, you know, do I like my reasons for becoming a specialist? Is this really coming from a place of you have this passion and you want to pursue this to make an impact in the area? Or is it coming from a place of, you know, you're, you know, you're worried that you're going to end up, um, you know, I guess like maybe from a place of feeling like this is what I ought to do or, or feel like I should do because, you know, um, you've decided this for yourself like early on and that kind of thing. So it's really difficult to do that on your own because you are in your own mind, you know, and so you've got these biases and you've got this like history of your own kind of like, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome. That's definitely something that a lot of people can relate to and something that I went through in terms of, you know, um, what it turns out with is like I had all these imposter syndrome thoughts about whether I was cut out to be a specialist and also this young you know the thing is I decided a lot of people they might choose to become a specialist later on when they've got many years of experience under their belt or again as a way to kind of reinvigorate their career because they've reached this stagnation whereas for me I was only my first year out after dental school already trying to pursue this and going, am I actually ready for this? If I make this long-term commitment, which seems a bit scary, and then I fail, you know, I put, uh, your the listeners can't see this, but I put fail in like quotation marks, um, you know, then, you know, all of those things were what was holding me back from actually wanting to pursue specialization, going, oh, maybe I'll just delay it a few years. And it was through coaching that I had, um, through yeah the leading clinicians program that helped me unpack all of that with this external person helping me look at what was going on in my brain together um, so that way I went into my specialist training knowing that I liked my reasons for going ahead with it that I had cleared out all of this subconscious kind of garbage around you know the fact that I couldn't do it and I didn't like my you know I didn't want to delay going becoming a specialist because of the reason that I didn't think I couldn't do it. So I'm one of 25 specialists in special needs dentistry in Australia. Uh, so that is, we're, we're kind of like an endangered species. If you think about the 4.4 million Australians that are living with a disability, and then 47% of our population um, have a chronic medical illness. So, you know, there's definitely a really big need out there and there's not enough of us out there providing the care. So that's where my passion for my advocacy comes from is around how can we 
like integrate more education and upskilling of general dentists to look after people with special needs, as well as encouraging more dentists to be interested in this, in this field. Yeah. So how did you find the specialist program? Because that's what some people will want to know about too. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk to that. So um, there are quite a few universities across Australia that offer the Doctor of Clinical Dentistry and Special Needs Dentistry. Um, so University of Queensland, um, Adelaide University, which is where I did my um, training. There's also one in Melbourne. Um, and oh, actually, yeah, I think I've covered all of them now. And so basically the requirements for it is to have had at least two years of general clinical experience before heading into the specialty and then have either done a honours project, which has some relevance to the specialty or have done your primaries. So that is like kind of like the tick boxes that you need in order to pursue. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you jump started that because you got that in within your first year. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you, when you're going through the program, right, like what are some of the things, were there any particular challenging parts to it? Cause a lot of people that I've talked to who are specialists and they talk about their, you know, pros or perio, it's like the long hours, the, um, the extra work that you're doing behind the scenes, um, yeah, the after absolutely. hours and stuff like that. So, I mean, for yourself, how did you find the program? Yeah, so definitely, um, there is a significant workload that is very different from undergrad level when you reach that postgrad level of training. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the big differences is that as an undergrad, you have lecturers that are giving you the information. Um, but as a postgrad, all of the curriculum content is created by you. So there are no lecturers giving you lectures. You are the one that's actually collating all the information and then you give a lecture to your colleagues um, and also to your convener. So the person that's like supervising your course. Um, there is also a thesis that is completed. Um, and, you know, that's like, like a significant um, workload that you then manage over the three years. Um, there's clinical placements and then you've got exams as well. So it is a very heavy workload. And also because of the costs associated with pursuing the specialist training, which can be significant, a lot of people that are doing specialist training like me will continue working as well so you're balancing that whole workload um, as well as working and I was actually still working full-time and tutoring at the university too <laughs> so I would okay, say yeah, that yeah. was definitely challenging but and the thing is um, this is something that a lot of people might be surprised to hear um, but there was a point partway through my specialist training, the way it works is that it kind of, the workload gradually increases over the like year one. Um, it's still a very heavy workload, but it gets worse over year two and then year three. So year one um, went, um, went fine. And I managed to like add in all the extra work, um, you know, still like I uh, didn't have many like issues there or anything. But then in the second year, when things started to pile on, um, the thing is there was a point where I started to reach like a near burnout period. Um, and the thing is externally, no one would have known because I was still very much like engaging with my patients, like getting all the work done, doing everything to a high standard, um, going above and beyond, like in terms of you know, you, you talked about other specialists talking about the hidden workload, like, you know, staying at the hospital to continue, um, you know, following up GP letters and talking to specialists and all these kind of things, you know, going above and beyond in all those aspects. But my internal experience was that I felt like, I don't know whether this is sustainable and starting to feel like, um, you know, I would wake up and in first year, like of specialist training, I would be like, couldn't wait to get out of bed and like, you know, just get out there and start the day, but then starting to dread the workload and feeling a lot of anxiety around, oh, mm. wow, like there's just a never ending list of things to do. Um, so again, that's like all mindset, you know, the situation um, wasn't like, of course, there's like an objective workload and you can either kind of go, oh, I'm going to put myself in a disempowered position and say, oh, look, anyone else would understand that, like why I'm feeling this way because of how challenging it is. And I'm still working full time, but this is where um, I really delve deep. So I actually did a mindset coaching certification and then use those coaching skills on myself and then was able to turn that around in that second year of specialist training. So 
I went from my internal experience. Um, again, no one would know from the outside because they could still be, see me like ticking all the boxes and doing all the things and to a high yeah. standard. But my internal experience completely changed when I then did that mindset work on myself. And um, the really amazing thing was that I then was able to start ticking all these like personal goals as well and then bring that work-life balance in the midst of specialist training because that's one of the things a lot of specialists talk about is that you kind of be prepared to like just sacrifice your own wants and your own personal goals like while you're doing specialist training but for me after I made that mindset shift it opened up this huge untapped potential that I had to not only excel in my specialist training but then to also like tick some really big personal goals that I had so at the end of my second year of specialist training I went from feeling almost burnt out like in the middle of it to then um, you know completing my exams um, doing all of the additional things that you need as you know second year goes on and then also um achieving a really big personal goal, which is that I did a fundraiser for the SA Cancer Council. Mm -hmm. um, and I ran a 105 kilometer ultra marathon on the Heisen Trail. <laughs> so, you know, that's just like a, an example of how, you know, my workload, you know, the situation hadn't changed or it had changed and made it even more difficult as in I had an objectively bigger workload at the end of the year than I did at the beginning of that second year. But just by me changing my mindset and how my internal experience was um, and focusing on what I could control, I actually created all this extra time and capacity for myself to now go and train for an ultra marathon at the same time. So it's just like an example and really showed myself that you can achieve like amazing things. Like when you just look at your mindset, like it's just, yeah, incredible. And that's where my passion for wanting to help other people in our profession to realize that as well you know you don't have to feel like you're at the mercy of whatever workload or patient load or circumstances that you have around you there is so much that you can control and take within your own power and then achieve the things that you want to achieve I mean yeah I mean to your point exactly like I don't as a listener I'm just trying to understand where yeah you went from because you're working full time. Okay. So specialist programs, people are always talking about, there's no way you can work full time. You're, you're, you've got a huge workload already. Then you might be able to do maybe one or two days on the weekend, but you're doing it full time along a full time specialist program. Then you're like talking to me about how, you know, you reach a point where you're like, okay, I need to reset my mindset. You're, you go and apply for a certification, which, like you said, adds more and more workload. And then that, compels you to go and and, uh, and 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 you know do other tasks that whilst everything is all happening is just you know building it all up i don't know <laughs> like how how can you like there's only 24 hours in a day right or you know there's only seven days in a week right yeah. and yeah you've got, a lot of people a, you've got all these assignments and all these <laughs> patient workload that you're already doing as a clinician but yet you still have time and energy to go and commit and train for all these other things. Like, yeah. I don't know I think how that's a thing. It's like, you know, I see time management as actually mind management or like energy management. Cause the thing is we all have like the same number of hours a day, but we do see that there are different people that have managed to achieve different amounts in that time. And what made the difference for me was that it was about my energy management because what was happening was I was spending so much time internally inside my own brain, let's say like with self-critical thoughts, like beating myself up for like these seemingly little things that I felt I could have done better. Um, and, you mean like you procrastinating? Know, versus yeah, procrastination. Versus that was a really big one that was linked to perfectionism. So a lot of the time when you have this perfectionistic tendency, you then dedicate a lot of time and energy into like procrastination because you're worried about, you know, oh, I don't want to start it because it has to be perfect, that kind of thing. So, you know, really, even though I added extra <clears throat> kind of workload to, to my plate by doing that mindset kind of like, because what I did was when I did that certification, it was actually like CPD for myself, like my own personal development. So I was then using those skills to then help me manage my own mind, manage my imposter syndrome thoughts, manage all of the self-critical thoughts, 
And that gave me so much more time and energy to now dedicate to doing something that I loved, which was running. Um, and yeah, being able to feel a lot more fulfilled in my role, because now when I showed up to clinic, the thing is, yes, clinic will make you physically tired. But the thing that I found hard to push through was when you're mentally tired, you know, like um, I was so mentally tired after a day of like, you know, self-criticizing myself, like, oh, you could have like done that a little bit better. Or you could have been quicker there. Or you could have done this. Um, and that is exhausting. Like I would, you know, end the day in clinic and then I would have all this admin to do and it would take me ages because I was so mentally exhausted. So it's just amazing how adding in that mindset piece and learning how to manage my own mind and my own thoughts actually then freed myself up because I still had the same workload, but I could finish it a lot quicker and have a much better time doing it because I was taking away this whole layer of, um, you know, kind of like self-suffering that I was doing unconsciously and was just like a habit that I'd built up over time. And I'm sure many people listening can relate to that, relate to that little voice that we have in our head that's constantly putting us down or telling us that we could do things better, particularly if you have like perfectionism tendencies, and then realizing how much that actually holds you back on a day-to-day -day basis. Once you release that layer, it's amazing what kind of potential you can tap into. Yeah. I mean... Wow. <laughs> I mean, okay. So let's, um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying, I, I mean, I got, I got caught up in the, in the, in just listening in. But, um, um, yeah. Okay. I lost my train of thought. I, I, was, I was just, um, okay. So, it's okay. okay I got did. it. So, okay. I mean, these are more soft skills. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I'm happy about. So how do you kind of figure out that this is the program that fits for you? Because I mean, for like hard skills, like a lot of these um, clinical skill courses that people do, they try to figure out, you know, if it may not be that first CP that they, you attend that you really kind of hone in on that being the best program for you. It, I mean, how do you, how did you determine that this, certification or this particular program was the one that you know um made sense to you like for some people maybe they might attend it and they might be like oh this isn't actually what I kind of expected to get out of it and, and then maybe they might have to attend something else like how do you determine amongst the programs out there mm, yeah that's a really good question um so to get like maximum benefit from CPD I see there being like two aspects so Part of it is finding CPD, which is like the right fit for your interests. You know, as you said, like, how did you decide this is like the one? And you have to align it with, you look at what skill sets you feel are your strengths and your weaknesses, where your gaps are and what you're interested in as well. Like, I think you need to have both of those things in order to then fully engage because then the second aspect that I was talking about to get benefit from a CPD is you actually engaging with the content and then implementing it so um the the process i would say that's like it's like everyone has to figure this out for themselves but i can share the way that i figured out what worked for me was that um you kind of use information and data from what previous cpd that you've invested in and decide like okay was that useful did i get benefit from it and then you use that to make educated decisions in the future so um what i found was that the cpd i got least benefit from when i looked at reflecting were ones which i'd signed up for which were like free and um <clears throat> kind of like once off kind of events so for example like a one day event um and that kind of thing and the thing is like yeah and and the and the reason why like those ones weren't, I wasn't getting benefit from them was because I wasn't valuing them because I hadn't invested any money in them. And actually there are psychological studies that show that this is a very common kind of phenomenon where the, you know, when people don't pay for something, they don't value it. Um, and the more they pay for something, the more they value it. Um, <clears throat> And so then through those experiences and realizing that the CPD that I was just signing up for because it was free, not because I was interested in it or not because it was something specific that I wanted to learn about. And also just like a once off as opposed to something that might be over a longer period of time, which you constantly re-engage and implement the content. I use that information to help me realize that, hey, I actually get more out of my learning when I actually, <clears throat> first of all, invest money into it 
Um, and particularly, you know, if it is like a significant amount, it means that my my brain will now decide, okay, if you're going to invest this amount of money that you're not going to use for, you know, some other personal thing, then I'm going to consciously sit down and decide to set aside time, make sure it's something really valuable that I'm going to get long-term benefit from, and I'm going to be interested in learning out of it. So that automatically means that I am now, you know, going to get more out of the course because I've made a decision to actually significantly invest money into it. And that was the case for my mindset course was that I had done like once off like um, motivational interviewing courses. I'm sure a lot of people have seen those around um, like once off kind of webinars that you listen to. Um, and that is like actually a coaching skill set. So motivational interviewing is coaching, but I found that I wasn't, you know, kind of fully engaging or getting a lot out of it. Whereas when you decide to actually certify, formally certify as a mindset coach, you know, it was a um, six month program. It was a very significant investment, like many, many thousands of dollars <laughs> um, mm -hmm. then and a lot of time investment. It meant that I was consciously deciding to show up every week, do all these extra assignments, find clients and practice and implement the coaching, right? As opposed to just absorbing the information. I had a cohort of people that were going through the same course over six months and people that were, you know, wanting to do this as an actual career. So, you know, surrounding myself with this community of people that were actually all opted in the same way that I was and had significantly financially invested and also invested a significant period of their time. You know, all of those things are what, kind of I've worked out helped me to then get the most that I want out of whatever like professional development it is um so yeah investing money into it because then that causes me to then think very carefully around investing time and my energy and my kind of like um uh, willingness to do, engage in it and then looking for courses that have more than just a once-off but an ongoing commitment um because again, you're making a conscious decision to set aside time for it week after week. Um, and then thirdly, that opportunity to connect with other people that are also fully opted in too, because then you have accountability partners, you have that social networking aspect that also helps to bring that engagement. And then you also can continue to integrate and discuss it with them um, over time so that you're actually implementing what you're learning and not just kind of absorbing it. And then it just, you know, doesn't go anywhere after that.